All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I, um, my name is Adam Domeyer. I'm from Minnesota. Um, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else from Minnesota in here? I know there's a, quite a bit from Iowa. Pastor Rodney. I know. Wouldn't you know? So, um, <laughs> all right. Well, it's good to be here this morning. Um, uh, this is my fourth year in Manti. First year was uh, back in 2014, and um, I uh, I came out uh, I came out with my wife uh, Hannah, who's back home watching our two little daughters back in Minnesota right now. So uh, they weren't able to make it this year, but um, but um, I miss them a lot, especially halfway through it. It gets uh, pretty difficult. Uh, without them here. So, um, but I, I started um, back in 2014, I started a blog called uh, Latter-day Saints uh, Latter .org, um, um, and it uh, turned into Latter-day Saints Evangelism Ministry. I'm in the process of incorporating that through the state of Minnesota right now. Um, I have a passion to, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so I, I have a huge passion to reach uh, Latter-day Saints. Um, I almost converted myself back in 2002. I'm 31 now, but back when I was 14 years old, my uh, family took a tour of Temple Square and <clears throat> Sister Missionaries asked my dad for a copy of the Book of Mormon and he very politely said no. And I asked my dad, I'm really curious, why did you say no? And he said, well, that's a story that we'll have to talk about um, when we get back home. We were in the middle of the trip doing a lot of hiking and things like that. Well, I wasn't that close with my dad at the time, so we never had that conversation. So I entered my ninth grade year in high school and a, a mutual friend introduced me to an LDS uh, friend named Mallory. Very pretty blonde girl. It's usually how it goes. <laughs> um, I asked her for a copy of the Book of Mormon and she gave me a copy and wrote a letter to me saying that, you know, I bury my testimony that this book is true. Um, if you read Moroni 10 verse 4, you will be able to pray about it and know whether it's true uh, yourself. So. I took up the challenge. I only made it through 1 Nephi chapter 4, and then I went straight to Moroni, prayed the prayer, knelt by my bed, um, experienced the burning in the bosom, um, experienced this warm, tingly feeling, and all of a sudden I said, oh my goodness, like, this church is true. That's, those are the words that came right out of my mouth. And I essentially self-indoctrinated myself into LDS beliefs for a period of about nine months, um, and I hid the whole thing from my family the entire time. And... Eventually, I found out that it was not true, but before that, my mom had taken all of my Mormon materials, journals, triple combination, ensign magazines, and things like that, that she found under my bed, and threw it at my feet outside, and said, if you join this cult, we're not having anything to do with you anymore. And that, when it, when it, came, time, when it came time to it, I was forced to burn all my books in the fireplace in my home. And that really built up a persecution complex with inside of me. And I wanted to join the church even more because of that. Um, when my dad came downstairs to talk to me, he sat on my bed and he said, you know what? I'm really not upset with you. I just want to know why. Because if you would have come to me initially and just talked to me about this, I would have been able to help you. And I thought, wow. And that was really the difference between my two parents is that one of them gave me a reaction and the other gave me a response. So that's what I would just say to challenge you, even if um, we're wrestling with our beliefs and we're, when we're working with Latter-day Saints, especially with teenagers, um, there's, a, there's a lot that's really going on. Um, so this next picture here, uh, this was actually only the St. Paul, Minnesota temple was only about 10 minutes away from where I lived at the time. Um, so if you go through the next, the next picture, um, it'll show my wife, my wife, uh, Hannah and I in front of the Salt Lake temple. And, and then the next one is our family. So that's, uh, Liesl and Ingrid right there at our church. So, um, and then the next one is just a, yeah, just kind of had to add that one in there. Um, the next one right here is, uh, Rob and I, uh, last year, um, with the josephlide.com signs. Now, I didn't start doing uh, missions work to Latter-day Saints until really 2013 because there was a period of about 10 years that I was very, very bitter with everything to do with Mormonism. I was very upset that I had been deceived by Joseph Smith, that I didn't want anything to do with the Mormon church. I didn't want anything to do with Mormons. So I, God really softened my heart toward the Latter-day Saints in 2013. And... 
and that's why I've um, I've been called to it ever since. And so um, since that time, um, the Lord has given me just um, compassion and a heart for them because I had realized where I came from, and I had realized what I had almost joined, and I realized that I that I couldn't go back. So these are some initial memories um, of Manti. You'll notice uh, back when Logan Williams was here um, on the guitar, this is back in uh, 2015. Um, and then you can see some more, um, you can kind of page through some of those, uh, just some ministering out on the streets. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, Rob Savalka um, and his sign. And then the next one with the water bottles, I don't know if you can... See these. This is something that I, I did last year and it ended up working really well. I just went to Walmart and bought about a hundred water bottles, and I have these little bracelets that are on the on my little table out there that has First Corinthians one eighteen and then my website on them. Well, it turns out that the bracelets fit exactly like perfectly around the water bottle. So I would go to the street corner by the temple and hand out these water bottles to passerby's, and I would make sure I made the first night. Um, they were pretty warm because they were sitting in my car all day. The next day, I learned from it and realized that I had to rotate water bottles out of my mini fridge in the hotel room to make sure they were cold, and people took them the next day. <laughs> um, but just even offering a water bottle and saying, hey, would you like some free water? Um, didn't get a single no from that. So that was really, that was really exciting. Um, uh, kind, of a, kind of a different way. But um, something that I had realized too, the first time I came out here, I only talked with one Mormon the first year I came out here the entire time because I really, really um, didn't know what I was doing, even though I used to believe in it. I didn't really know how to interact with Latter-day Saints. And when I came here, I realized that I needed to really get a feel for how people here on the ground are doing it before I just jump out and try to do it myself. And that's part of the concept about know those who labor among you. And how important that is. Because I couldn't just go out from once I had believed in Mormonism to jumping out of it to just jumping right into ministry. Because there's such a danger for someone to just um, jump out of something and become a novice in ministry and jump right into ministry. Because a lot of times, um, a lot of times it's easy to get deceived by other things when that happens. So I had to really take my time and learn how people in ministry are doing it and then fall underneath that. And so that's something that really helped me a lot. So I would just say, encourage you to really learn from the people here, whoever they are, whoever they are that have been doing this type of ministry for, for a long time. Um, that's, that's something that's very helpful. So if you go to the next slide here, this is just a group of friends. You guys will know who you are. Um, last year, it's been amazing because um, there, there's been um, five people I've been keeping in touch with since last summer. We literally have kept the same group text going the entire over this entire year and have just been in contact with each other. So it's been it's been just amazing to be able to keep in touch. Um, and then the next one, this is just street preaching last year. Um, the next picture right here, this is the sign that has worked for me a lot this year. I almost joined the church. Asked me why I didn't. Um, I would just stand right on the corner and then have the sign facing the temple. And it's amazing when families walk by, a lot of people didn't really come up to it. But then once they set their things down, teenagers would come out and ask me questions, especially teenagers between the ages of 10 and 17. And I came out here thinking that I would use the impossible gospel um, technique. And as much as I love that, what I found that the Lord was opening the doors to talk about this year has been Joseph Smith. And when they ask, why, why didn't you? And I first started asking, I said, okay, you know, what's your name? How old are you? I asked that question, how old are you? Well, I'm 14. And I said, well, I have two daughters myself. My oldest is four and a half. And when my oldest daughter turns 14, 10 years from now, how, if there was a 38 year old man that wanted to date my 14 year old daughter, how do you think I would feel about that? And they just, you know, jaw dropped and say, that's really awkward. And I said, that's exactly what Joseph Smith did. And those are things that I ran into that I had a huge problem with. And I I could not accept that a man that would do these things could be an actual prophet of God. And what happened is a lot of these conversations that I would have, 
it just it would get it would just be so real they would be able to resonate that with that there's something about dealing with a number and dealing with an age kind of like when the display of the 34 wives was in front of the temple there's something about seeing something visually or being able to just see what this actually means in reality and have it really hit whoa that would make me uncomfortable um, so those have been those have been able to plant a lot of seeds just by um, just by really um, talking to them about the real history of the church and their founder. Because if the Book of Mormon is the keystone of their religion, and the entire religion falls apart based on the Book of Mormon, what does that say about the man who wrote the Book of Mormon? Um, if he was not a prophet of God, the entire LDS church collapses. And so this has been something that has been um, really, really helpful for me to engage um, with, younger, with younger teenagers. Um, so the next slide here, this is something that my, um, my method, I mean, it's kind of nice because we are members, all different members of one body and each, di each different member of this one body has completely different methods that work for them. And th this is what I absolutely love. There's some of you that do certain things that I just, I can't do that. I'm not called to do. And that's okay because there are not only different Christians that have different approaches, but Latter-day Saints also need to receive it in different ways. Because there is someone that might need, that might um, have more of a bulldog personality that needs that wrestling, that needs kind of that confrontational dialogue. And then there's some that have been so hurt by things that have happened in their family that they are just needing someone to listen to them. And so... I think it's amazing how not only that we have different ways that we approach Mormons, but Mormons have different ways that they need to receive it. So this is what I call the empathy effect, compassionate conversations with Mormons. Um, the first thing um, that I'll note too is that um, it's impossible to hurt over someone that you don't care about. It's impossible. And I could not have cared less about Mormons before I was called to reach them. I, I just, it just did not, it just didn't resonate with me. And then something that, um, uh, something that Spurgeon had said is a while, quite a while ago is that if you don't have any desire for people to get saved, then you're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. And I just, I read that and I said, wow, that's convicting because how is my desire or lack of desire for someone to get saved? How is, how is, what does that really look in my life? So I had to really check myself on that. The next one is that sometimes a pure motive does not exactly translate into a pure method. So even if we have a good motive and a, a really solid motive behind what we want to see happen in talking with a Latter-day Saint, it doesn't always translate into a pure method. Um, such as, you know, someone throwing the Book of Mormon on the ground or stomping on it or mocking certain things is an example of a method that's not pure. Um, and so we make, just making sure that we're checking our motives and that our motives meet our meth match our methods. The next slide um, here, with every, it goes along the lines of what Romans 12, 18 says about um, do everything you can to be at peace with everyone, but at the same time, with everything in your power, try not to be a sour saint. <laughs> Um, after all, honey attracts people more than vinegar does. Um, so it, just, just to keep in mind, um, to, go on to, the, to go on to the next slide here, uh, nonverbal communication oftentimes speaks louder than verbal communication. So while it is important what to say, it's also important to know how we're presenting ourselves to ourselves to Latter-day Saints while we're out on the streets. For example, in my job back home in Minnesota, I'm an enrollment counselor and I meet with students one-on-one -on -one to invite them into our graduate and seminary programs. And something that they trained us to do is, you know, when you're talking to people, make sure that you're, you know, you have an appropriate distance, uh, you know, away from them. And something that my, that I, I still work with my grandfather on, I'm very close with my grandpa, but he, um, Sometimes it's, it's, it's that kind of generation where when he talks to me, he'll come in about six inches away from me and talk to me. And I'm like, 
slowly backing up while talking to him. And then here we are about four feet over this way towards the end of our conversation, simply because I, I'm one, I think part of it's because I'm German, I'm Minnesotan, we need, we need some space. <laughs> um, but just kind of paying attention to those things. And also if we're talking with someone and then we, and then we you know, start crossing our arms, this can oftentimes be a sign of disagreement. Now, even when we, even if we were to disagree with a Latter-day Saint, obviously with their theology or the things we're saying, it's important to, to not really show signs of, of this because it could be very off-putting and they could kind of tell that we're not really willing to engage. So just kind of be aware of, you know, the things that we're doing um, to have appropriate eye contact, use mannerisms, you know, when when appropriate and things like that, it can really engage someone, especially if you're handing out tracks or have a sign, just make eye contact and smile as they're walking by. Um, it can really make a huge difference. So uh, the next one too is presumption is the worst form of communication. And I really realized this the second, second year I was here because I had done so much studying on, on Mormonism to the point where I wanted to come out to the streets to tell them, to tell the individual Latter-day Saints what they believed rather than asking them, what are your thoughts on this? Um, uh, case in point, the other night, I was talking to um, a young man, 17-year-old guy named Jared, and he grew up in LDS church, and I, he said, why didn't you join? And I said, well, Joseph led the people after other gods. And he said, what are you talking about? There's only one God. And I said, you are absolutely right. That's what the Bible teaches. And he said, my church teaches that there's many gods. And the light bulb came on. And I said, yes. So we went to Abraham chapter four and five, where it talks about the gods creating the worlds. And he said, this is wrong. This is not right. He was like, I, I mean, God is, has always been God. And I said, you're right. Um, <laughs> and I said, what, what? If, if, God, if we consider God the most high God, how could God have a God before him or above him? How could we consider God the most high God if that is possible? And he said, oh, geez. And, and um, we're keeping in touch now. And so just pray for Jared. But this is kind of the thing about presumption, because if I were to, t if I were to have told him, look, the LDS church isn't true because you believe that there's many gods. I would be presuming that he believes that. Whereas oftentimes members won't necessarily believe certain LD or official teachings. Um, so that's why um, we have to be careful what we presume that they believe. Um, so the next one here, um, this, this is artificial agreement is actually worse than genuine conflict. So keep in mind, um, that we are to contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints, just like in Jude says. Um, this creates genuine conflict because there's contention um, that's naturally there. And a lot of times, too, there's a, lot of, there's a huge ecumenical spirit that a lot of Latter-day Saints have had on the streets by saying, hey, look, we're all children of Heavenly Father. Can't we just, I mean, we're all going to be together in the end. Um, and if I were to come in, in, into agreement with that, it would be an artificial agreement because that's not the truth. So peacemakers are people who are willing to let the ceiling fall on the present situation in order to allow the possibility of peace to come. So I would challenge you that as, as you are out on the streets, that as you are a peacemaker, you're someone who's willing to let the ceiling fall on the situation. An offense takes place because the gospel itself is offensive to the natural man. So the next, on the next slide here, um, any unlikelihood of agreement will never negate the necessity to speak the truth in the first place. So this isn't necessarily taking a risk, but it's actually stepping out in faith because we can't believe in the gospel until someone has come and preached the gospel. So I would just challenge you um, to continue to speak up. Now the next slide, this, this is something that has just, just as much as Rob Savalka's sign burns in your retinas, um, the josephfly.com sign, this is something that has just um, has been on my spirit for a long time. Before a Latter-day Saint is a Latter-day Saint, they are a person. It's that simple. And this has really changed my mindset a lot because 
not only seeing a Latter-day Saint as like a, a convergent conversion object, but as a person. And that's really where the, the empathy effect comes in, that we're really hearing their stories and that there, we're really, um, really just hearing them out and hearing where they're coming from. And when they talk about their feelings of the Book of Mormon, their feelings that the church is true, I like to turn those feelings around. And especially when I said how, I, I like to ask questions about when I told you that Joseph Smith had married teenage girls, how does that make you feel? So questions about asking them questions about feelings, how things that you are sharing with them make them feel because of their respect and their reliance on their feelings, ask those questions back and how does this really make you feel? So the next slide here, um, this is actually a, a quote from my grandmother. <laughs> um, she, she's the wisest woman I've ever known. She said, you know, you know what, Adam, people criticize what they don't understand. Now, with that said, people oftentimes don't try to understand what they've already criticized. So keep in mind that a lot of times when you get a lot of flack for what you're preaching and what you're sharing, they're criticizing it because they don't understand. Um, next, yeah, next one. So kind of along the lines of uh, Spurgeon's quote that I mentioned before, your depth of your desire to see someone else saved is only as deep as your relationship with the Lord. So I just challenge you this week um, to continue to dig into the word of God, continue to fellowship with believers, because that's definitely not wasted time. The first year I came out here when I had only, or the second year when I had only talked with um, a Latter-day Saint the entire time, I had realized that it was not wasted time because I had fellowship with believers and got to know so many people and the Lord looks upon that and it helps to strengthen your own faith. So um, something, a great quote from Peter Drucker about communication, that the most important thing in communication is hearing what isn't said. So this goes back to the, the whole point about watching nonverbals while we're, while we're talking with people, that just pay attention to the things that are really stirring in their mind. If you can tell that they're looking confused, um, you know, that's something to really, um, to really pay attention to as well. And the next, the next quote is by John Powell. Communication works for those who work at it. <laughs> I mean, it seems, it seems simple, but um, it, it's, it's amazing because the streets of Manti give you practice. It gives, they give you a lot of practice. And um, when I, it, it's like when I, before I met my wife, um, I met her at church, but before that, I hadn't gone on many dates before, and I would used to go, you know, go with some friends to the mall, and I would go into some shopping stores, and I would practice, um, you know, by going into a store and asking, asking a girl, hi, how are you doing? Like, and start to get to, to you know, to get myself to, to finally talk to girls, and I had to work at it, and it took practice, and it took practice, and it took practice, um, <laughs> And so that's, that's one way, but, um, <laughs> um, Americans ever say anything bad? Uh, I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> no, they did not. <laughs> um, okay, so <laughs> so so it's 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 always great just to just to practice. Um, even a couple years ago, when there was a lot of role playing up here, um, it's it's you know between uh, someone portraying a Latter Day Saint, someone portraying the Christian perspective, and just just talk among your friends and. Play devil's advocate. Say, I know the church is true and go from there. And then, um, well, the church is not true. Um, but just to, just, to, just to learn to engage um, a little bit more too. So the next slide, um, the, the issues that people are oftentimes passionate about may differ from official church teaching. So what I, what I usually don't start conversations with are, um, are things like, you know, Mountain Meadows Massacre or some of these more, you know, certain teachings in the Journal of Discourses. I might not go to that right away. 
because that's not what I want to start the conversation with. But if they bring up those issues and those are issues that are important to them or those are issues that they will bring up that might be that they might be putting on the shelf, then I want to pay attention to that and definitely respond to that. And keep in mind, too, that it's 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 more important to rely on your knowledge of the truth than on our ability to quote the counterfeit. So keep that in mind too. While it is important to reference LDS standard works, um, it's, it's also extremely important to study the truth and to know the truth because the word of God is the two-edged sword. The word of God is what will pierce their hearts. So the next one here. This is something that really dawned on me when I um, almost joined the church. If you, if, you have to, if you have to make renovations on revelations, they're not revelations in the first place. If you have to change revelations, they're not revelations in the first place. So keep that in mind that as you're sharing things with Latter-day Saints, let them know what's at stake. Um... So on the lighter end, I love memes. I don't know, however many of us love memes, but I just thought I'd uh, throw in here a few hashtag things Jesus never said. Um, Everybody will totally like you for being my follower. Jesus never said. Um, So keep in mind that when you're out there in the streets, not everyone will like what you're doing, but keep in mind that you're doing the will of the Lord. Next one, do not warn the sinner. That's unloving and judgmental. Hashtag things Jesus never said. Uh, the next one. If the world hates you first, or if the world hates you, remember it hated me first. Until I modernized to get with the times and changed all my teachings so they would be easier to follow, then everyone pretty much liked me again. <laughs> Hashtag things Jesus never said. I put these in there just because in Minnesota, the, the way that the culture has gone, it's the same with a lot of parts in the nation. It's becoming very difficult to live out your Christian faith. And so um, these things have been, these things have kind of been um, the climate of the culture back there. And so just to keep in mind um, that when you go forth in boldness, um, it's for a good cause. Uh, the next one, truth sounds like hate to, the, to those who hate the truth. So keep in mind, uh, now when you go to the next one here, just a visual of that The only thing that could remove the blindfold of lies is the gospel. And like has been shared many times that, you know, the Latter-day Saints are blind. So leading them carefully in order to grab their hands and lead them forward rather than to stand behind them and push them. So making sure that we're truly guiding them. I had to throw this, this last one in here. Elder Quentin Cook, um, The face you make after you've been forced to publish a series of essays admitting that all those anti-Mormon lies are actual, just verifiable facts from Mormon history. (laughs) So, real quick, um, the Gospel Topics essays are very important to share with Latter-day Saints. This close to leading um, a girl named Erilyn to the Lord the other day, simply because of sharing a Gospel Topics essay with them. Um, it's, It's very important to know that... The actual anti-Mormon, like when she said, she said, I don't, I don't know, that's, that sounds like it's from an, anti, an anti-source or anti-book or an anti-Mormon website. And I said, it, it actually is. And she said, well, what is it? And I said, LDS.org. <laughs> and she said, I don't understand. And so we walked through how actual church, official church history is anti-Mormon because it oftentimes will contradict. So this next one here, real quick, um, Daniel in the middle, Justin over here, Daniel in the middle left the LDS church three years ago while on his mission to, in Chile after he found my website and we got in touch and we started communicating. He then led his friend Justin out of the LDS church because he had baptized him as a member. We actually met in Nauvoo and drove down through Kinderhook, saw um, Zelf Mound and it was a very nerdy trip in the middle of December, <laughs> um, but this is, just, this is just an example of the fruit that you can see because of stepping out and not giving up on the Latter-day Saint people. So I would encourage you with that. Just one quick slide right here. This is my book, Almost a Mormon. 
Um, it's on Amazon. I've got a few left on the table out there. You're more than welcome to um, pick up a copy if you want. It's got my, the story in the entirety. So thank you all. Just wanted to bless you and encourage you.